Hi there, and welcome to episode six of Delightful Descent. Today, I'm with Sarah Osterholzer. So uh, welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to uh, great to have you on the uh, on the show. So um, I just uh, if you if you happen to be new to the show, though, I want to give you a quick description of, of what we do here. Um, this series is really about challenging assumptions and it's about thinking about things in a different way so they don't hold us back anymore so they don't place limits on the things that we can do and the way that we can feel about things and feeling good about what we do so what you can get from this show is yeah you can learn from people who are doing this work already and doing amazing stuff and challenging assumptions and learn some things that you can take for your own life and use in your own work as well but equally it's about learning the practice of challenging assumptions and showing what that's like and how we do that because i want everyone to be able to do this i want everyone to be empowered to challenge the way things are and move things forward in a better way for them and for the people around them so it's called delightful dissent though because Challenging assumptions is dissent. It's challenging authority. It's challenging the way we think about things. And that's not a safe thing to do always. It's a very scary thing to do. And it's a thing that we can get in a lot of trouble for. But the delightful part is really about how we go about it and how we approach it. So the intention is to, yeah, challenge assumptions, but not to take things away, to come up with something better that serves us and other people better, instead of just being like, I'm right, you're wrong, bye. So that's what we're going to be doing throughout today. We're going to be exploring an assumption and seeing how it works and how it doesn't. And this is a process of engagement. Yet yeah, primarily it's a conversation between me and Sarah but it's also a conversation between you in the community who are watching this right now and who are watching on the recording as well, in fact. If you are watching live, you can share comments on YouTube uh, and that would be very much appreciated if you do. Um, at any point at all, there, there will be some specific space at the end to, for us to, to answer any questions that come up throughout the show. But yeah, do, do join comments and... Uh, and, and get stuck in because it really is an engagement process and that's really an important part of this for me as well. So I really wanted to talk to Sarah. Um, I, I first met her through the Good Business Club and uh, yeah, we've, we've kind of spoken about purposeful business and all sorts of really exciting stuff around that. But I, I was really struck with her kind of energy and vision and, and that that's, but coming from a slightly different place to the normal disruptive startup place, which I've kind of spent some time in, um, has always been slightly unsatisfying for me. And, and, and her her view was, was really quite different and quite refreshing. And when we spoke about what we were actually going to discuss today, we came up with a topic that's really, really close to my heart as well um, and really matters to me. So, so I'm really particularly excited to talk to Sarah today. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to, first of all, ask you to introduce yourself a little bit, tell us a little bit about what you do and the kind of people that you work with, please. Amazing. Thank you, Matthew. So nice to also just hear a little, um, a little bit about how, who I am to you as well. Um, so I think a little bit about me. So I'm uh, on a mission really to demystify the world of, of good business. Um, because I think the world as it is really needs to change and a lot of um, systems and models that are just quite old and outdated and aren't serving our society and we need to be thinking differently and reshaping um, everything from you know government education system as well as business and um, so that's why I've kind of dedicated I guess my career to understanding and exploring different models um, and starting up good businesses and it's why I help predominantly first-time entrepreneurs looking to start up businesses that are really close to their heart that want to impact um, not just themselves but the world around them as well um, so that's kind of people I work with. Super thank you very much so before we get into to we really get into today's assumption which um, is it's unprofessional to share your full self at work what I'd uh, like to do, uh, Sarah, is I believe you've got a quote that you can share that kind yeah. of starts us off in that direction. 
Mm, yeah, so the quote I got is uh, from Brene Brown, who we're talking about um, our full selves, felt very apt for this conversation. So the quote is, uh, vulnerability is the birthplace for innovation, creativity and change. I really like that. And I, I think it really captures the positive reasons to engage with this. I've spent mm. a lot of time working in technology and, and a lot of technology is a lot of people talk about innovation in technology, but it's actually much more scarce than 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 the amount it's talked about. It's kind of a lot of people talk about it and not a lot of people are doing it. Um, and I think it's really interesting because it's hard and we don't talk about why it's hard <laughs> um, and how you can engage with that. And I think it's really important to know this isn't, when we're, when we're talking about kind of being your full self, um, it's not just a nice to have. I think it's really important to remember that, that, that these things are relational and, and, and this is actually about ourselves and our power to change things for our, in our own interests, yes, but mm. equally in the interests of other people as well. Mm, no, absolutely. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of exploring that a bit more of, of you, know, you know, what is vulnerability and, and what is our full selves and why is there kind of a disconnect sometimes in the world of business of, of being our full selves when it's something we're very much encouraged to do in uh, other places in our life and other relationships as well. Mm, I think there, there is an interesting, you know, this really does for me get to the heart of um, of, of the assumption that we're, we're looking at and, you know, why why we are a different person at work and what that mm. means, you know, why, why we feel we have to be and how we can engage with that so that mm. we uh, so that we can resolve it in a positive way. And again, I think yeah. it's it's one of the big challenges is, is that that isn't always obvious. Mm. You know, it, it's not just a case of turning up one day and going like, right, this is me. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an exp exploration for ourselves, isn't it? Of You know, when I say like, what is our full self? That's something as humans we're exploring every day. And I think where I come to this conversation is uh, where in, in my past about uh, five years ago, I suddenly experienced um, social anxiety, like really intensely to the point that I couldn't really go out and socialize with anyone, let alone work and that was my first really uh, intersection between my full self and work and you know how do I bring that into the workplace can I bring it into the workplace will it impact my work will it impact my opportunities um, and my discovery is kind of from that angle and it's really opened up my eyes to all the different things people have to deal with in a sense in terms of their full selves um, yeah yeah, I'm just gonna break, sorry, break quickly to close the door because there is some background noise in the background. Cool, thank you. So yeah, this is obviously live. You know, this is one of the vulnerability things, uh, and I think you know the, the the liveness of everything is is uh, is is part of this this work. So yeah, it's really uh, it's uh, yeah, stuff happens sometimes. So great, thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> cool. I, I was gonna say. I, I think it's really interesting and this is one of the places where our journey intersects and I've experienced quite a lot of anxiety and social anxiety as well. Now, interestingly for me, I think I had such a protected work identity that it didn't really show up at work in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and that 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 was um, in the long run, that didn't serve me, but in the short run, it, it kind of, it felt more comfortable to be working and in that space at work than it did to be mm -hmm. outside of that in that more vulnerable space mm -hmm. so yeah yeah no absolutely i think like um yeah kind of going in, into into that like so when i experienced it, i actually reached out to a mentor of mine at the time and just said look this is what's come up for me like what do i do can i talk to about it with my boss can i not and um when i start saying about full self-expression is what i've really gauged like because she said some really great advice she said look it's what you're dealing with. If you go to them and they say, we're going to drop you, like that says more about them than it does about you. And I think that was it really kind of stayed with me as well. And I actually went and obviously they were amazingly supportive about it and, you know, gave me all the opportunities I needed. But it really was a really inter inter intersection between like, if we don't know, like how come we don't know that we can bring things to work? How come there is a taboo about about certain topics like mental health, or maybe it's around, you know, disabilities, or there's diff we're all different in some way, and there's certain things that are more kind of normal and more common 
and the other things we actually don't really still know how to have conversations about them for me that's really interesting mm, absolutely i think so what would be really helpful to, to get us going into this is are there any particular experiences where it feels like this assumption has shown up for you you know where, mm. where it's whether whether it's kind of been stated explicitly or whether it just feels like something you've been bumping up against um, mm. in your own life yeah so I think definitely something around mental health and the way I think as it's shown up one is my personal life but also in conversations I have with a lot of people who are dealing with something whether it's uh, just a one-off thing that's kind of come up and it's having a massive impact in their life and they're really some way kind of struggling and trying to fit there and kind of kind of fake it in work just to mm. fit in with the norm um, and don't want to talk about it um or or it is like we have a lot of conversations people coming to like say, say at the good business club or talking about good business around actually how can we make the space for people in work actually more reflective of, of the situation outside of work like that's mm. the two things i see very commonly are still there in conversation but there's somehow a disconnect between the two Mm, I think that's really interesting, and, and one of the big challenges is this is this this is relational, you know, and it, it's this it's this idea of work as this isolated, separate thing, mm. and it's it it you know we kind of have to when we tell ourselves that we need to be a different person at work, we kind of need to separate ourselves from that context, yeah. and it's it's one of the interesting things I often um, think about. When people talk about work life balance, and and mm. balance is an interesting word because we often um, we often say balance when actually we mean compromise, mm. and they're different things. Uh, and 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 most people are actually thinking about a work life compromise where both sides mm. are a bit compromised, yeah. rather than a balance where both sides support one another. Absolutely, yeah. I think one thing I've also kind of uh, really explored this year is around uh, discovering that I've been trying to be a businesswoman. Like mm. as if there's this concept that exists of what a businesswoman is, and it's like, oh no, wait, just look at what you've got a business that makes you a businesswoman. It's not like I have to be a certain way, and um, and I think you're so right in terms of the the compromise, isn't it? And and why it has to be either or, um, why can't it be that you know who you are is part of of the world of business? Like, why is there a disconnect there? Why do we only bring certain things into work? And actually, we will not share that in, in another situation as well. But also, like, why do we have these concepts of what, you know, professional is or, you know, and I think it's only recently that I've started just being really inspired by people who are very out of the normal box of businessy. And for me, that is about their full selves. They will bring things like vulnerability. And I think that's why I also love Brene Brown, because she had a really great conversation about shame that no one was talking mm -hmm. about. But look at her, like everyone knows who Brene Brown is because there's something really relatable that she's talking about that somehow is missing in a conversation when it comes to work. Mm, absolutely. And I, I think that that idea of shame is a really interesting one. And, and it's something I've kind of explored in my own work and personally as well. And, and that relationship to really having being wrong you know, mm -hmm. and, and there's a there's an element of of having a, an absolute truth uh, mm -hmm. and 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 something there, and that's really really, you know, that that's so such a deep assumption. You know, that we mm -hmm. know what we're doing. I think that's one of the big for me. That's almost the biggest lie at work, mm -hmm. is that we know what we're doing, or at least the boss yeah. does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one of I one of my one of my experiences as I went up in organisations. Is that I got pretty I, I realized I knew far less about what I was doing. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think especially when we start talking about certain taboo topics, like I said, like either mental health or something where in society is seen as a weakness or something that's lacking, it suddenly becomes like it impacts your capability. Like I think people are worried if they share something, people are gonna think that they're incapable to do the work they're gonna do. And I think that's has massive impact there isn't it in terms of shame of like what if I can't do what I'm gonna do but then you're right if we're already like it's actually what I say a lot with business people say why do you enjoy business I said actually it's quite creative because you can kind of make things up as you go and there's no really right or wrong but if you are in that world already of just kind of like exploring discovering every day something else that in society is kind of classed as a weakness is going to make you feel worried like maybe I won't share this I'll just 
pretend that it's not there and keep faking it again you know to but there's i always believe there's there's some um, element if, if you're not fully truthful or fully sharing of something people can gauge that people mm. can gauge when you're completely like expressing what's important to you um and and if you're not and i think that's interesting when we start talking about trust because business is a lot about trust and if we're not fully expressing ourselves and people can feel that will that actually impact you know what you can do in business mm. and i i think one of the interesting things is you know we we, we it's quite taboo to doubt in business you know mm -hmm. it's there's this idea of of kind of absolute confidence and absolute mm -hmm. certainty and one of the really interesting things about that is is where where that does exist where doubt does exist and i i'm a big believer in the in the value of all emotions and that they tell us important things they're not they're not good and bad in and of themselves they're, they're mm. telling us things about the environment and doubt tells us that there's some uncertainty there mm. that there is it's something there and that's not necessarily a bad thing you know and it, it's important to explore that and if we if we don't explore that we do actually lose trust over mm. time and I, I think if we're talking about you know leadership and and that that pushing into the unknown mm we can't know we're bringing people along with us and, and the vulnerability involved in in pushing out into that we need to be able to be be comfortable with our own doubt mm. and with other people's and working with that and integrating that because it's only by exploring that doubt that we can come to a better truth a more reliable truth Absolutely. and i think there's there's something really when we can't bring our full selves and our full range of ability to experience the world we can't come to that mm. yeah there's something um i see a lot with the people i work with so a lot of them are first time entrepreneurs so very new to business so they'll normally be quite specialist in the area all the kind of impact they want to make they know really well about that but when it comes more to like the commercial side and how do you actually set up a business it's completely new and even though they could be very confident in what they do it does suddenly bring up all of this like which people who are working at like in imposter syndrome is, is something i'm very aware of now but you can see for someone like it really is a moment when you're like oh no i totally get it like everyone feels that when they share something because for them it's is that like it's huge it's in their face every day and it, and it wants to stop them doing what they want to do um and also like perfectionism isn't it like we've talked about that before as well like if you're a perfectionist you're gonna you have to learn to like let that go as well but all of this stuff again would kind of come come to more in like expressing yourself fully because um, unless you know that everyone else is going through that, you think it's just you, and that can be one of the biggest challenges if you think something is just your challenge and no one else will get it and you don't know how to overcome it. Sometimes just sharing with someone else will get them to be like, oh yeah, no, I'm the same, or I've experienced that as well, or yeah, that's the thing, like here's a book about it. You know, That can be a huge lift off someone's shoulders to actually help them move forward. Um, so I think that's really interesting, those kind of different topics that I see a lot with people around certainty when there definitely isn't any. Mm. For me, I think there's also something you know. There's a relationship between perfectionism and idealism, and they're mm. kind of they kind of often show up in similar places. And, and for me, my experience is I'm much more idealist than I am perfectionist, mm. and both both create a problem um, in the sense of like, waiting for something to be ideal and creating mm. the ideal circumstances versus perfect execution. And mm. they're, they're, um, and I think idealism can prevent you from getting started. Perfectionism mm -hmm. tends to prevent you from finishing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think there's a, there's a really interesting thing between two. And I, I think a lot of us who, who are led to this purpose-led space can mm -hmm. tend towards, we have a strong sense of what could be. Yeah. Um, and that can lead us towards idealism and that difficulty of getting started, of engaging at all, mm -hmm. rather than getting in the weeds and getting stuck when we do. Yeah, I think it's a, probably a really good example when we're talking about bringing your full self to work of where that happens and it can it can be a, a quite a barrier, like you said. So if you're super passionate about something, especially if it's something that's you know somehow impacted your life or, or something really in society that you want to change and you've got an ideal around it, you really will bring your whole self and you're, normally the business you shape will basically be a replication of your values, of, of what's important to you, also your strengths and your weaknesses. Like it really is you in a different form. 
And then it can be even more challenging stepping out and, and trying things, testing things, taking on feedback, all of that as well, will will feel like a personal thing. I think that's yeah. really important of how actually, how can you channel that that passion and those ideas, but also separate it. So that, that now we're talking about separation in a sense of people who are fully them, like themselves so intertwined in their work that it can feel really personal when actually, like I said, business can be a very creative, evolving thing. If you don't, if it takes too much of an impact and it seems like either failure or it's not the right thing, whatever it is, it can actually then stop people from creating really amazing things. Mm. I think that that there's something really interesting in there. You know, there's there's a there's a degree of conformity of being normal in this for me yeah. and and the need to be kind of to fit in to be normal um and and when we do that you know if we're talking about innovation and change and we're talking about completely new circumstances we have to strike out we have to move out into that space of the unknown and we're not mm-hmm. We have to be able to engage with it and 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 to work with it for ourselves and for other people. And I think completely it's it's we're not actually taught that some of this is safe. We're often yeah. taught that it's unsafe. And when I say we're taught that it's unsafe, I mean in school and in less healthy workplaces, we're punished for showing this stuff. Mm-hmm. So there is something important to un, you know, we almost have to unlearn some of this. Yeah. particularly when we're very sensitive to certain things and and this is one of the interesting things for me around the normal it's like the, the normal range of sensitivity and the normal way of expressing that sensitivity mm, is absolutely. is a huge thing and and it's we moved from like in some degree in in i think in, in in, in the way we think about the world collectively, from there being like this absolute truth and us having to conform to this this fixed absolute truth. But instead we've got this kind of normative truth. It's like mm. we have to be as normal as possible. So it's not being true, it's about being normal. Yeah, yeah. I'm smiling a lot because so I grew up in India and came to England when I was about, you know, maybe 13 and I remember that people to be like what you grew up in India and I very quickly was like okay I'm clearly not normal and same with my career so I went straight into I did a degree in international business but I went straight into working with startups and that's very much been my world I haven't had a corporate experience I only ever hear it from people I meet um so it's interesting how I guess probably it's why I've been so trying to figure out like what is this normal you know professional businesswoman look like I need to figure that out rather than just being who I was and you're right like we're, we're trying to get it right all the time rather than just being just being mm. we're trying to figure out like what's right and what's wrong and you're right that's what we get that's how we've been brought up isn't it there's a very strong thing in education system but also like just how you are brought up society will also tell you what's right and what's wrong so we're going to business I'm like okay there's a right and a wrong here which one which one am i in how do i become the one that's right all the time rather than just being like we're all humans that's what it is just be and and just focus on what you're doing mm. yeah and, and that idea of there's something really interesting that comes up for me around that kind of the transactional nature of work, you know, and, and the fact that I'm just, you know, business isn't, per, you know, like it's not personal in business. And it, absolutely, it's personal. You know, why would you spend your time doing something so alienated from yourself? <laughs> you know, I, mean, I think it's, it's genuinely an important thing. And, and that really brings me to, to, to you know, we, we wanted to explore mental health as part of this, really. And I think what we describe as a healthy and unhealthy and ways of relating are really a big part of this. I personally, I don't think it is healthy. It's not wholesome. It's not really sustainable for us to have this really hard separation between bits of our identity. It's very fractured. Um, and where we can work with that and, and and kind of integrate instead, that that's definitely a step towards more resilience um, and more opportunity because it lets us see things that we wouldn't otherwise have seen in in the possibilities. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. So again, I can speak from my experience and from people who I've known who've had something that's impacted them. Um, I think what I really discovered is if you hold back from sharing things, especially in a work profession, 
Um, and actually, this is true also for friends and family, is there's a disconnect in terms of relatableness. So something that I've kind of feedback on from, from different people in my life, including professional and uh, personal, is that they sometimes have an image of who I've been and I might not understand or fully get where other people have been as well. Mm. And in sharing fully who I am and what I've experienced and what I deal with every day, like every other human, it's actually got me closer. And specifically when I talk about work as well, like there's much more connection. People are like, okay, now you actually understand where I've been or you get who I am rather than being this like perfect person that one of those professional businesswomen had was that I was trying to <laughs> showcase. And actually people are like, no, like now you get me. Now I can come and work with you because you understand my journey and what I'm what I'm going on. If you haven't got that relatableness, it comes back to trust again, isn't it? Mm. Like you people can feel that and it actually might negatively impact you and your business. And we see that as well with you know a lot of big corporates like everyone's looking at it now and going, if you're not transparent with with what you're doing, people can see straight through it and they're not going to want to buy from you. Whereas if a business, no matter how big or small, is sharing, actually, this is what the situation is, this is what we're going to do. Transparency is is, is huge, actually, in, in terms of building uh, loyalty and trust and connection. And I think more of that in business will actually help businesses be better as well. Mm, and I think this, for me, there's a, you know, transparency is about seeing the whole process and seeing it all at least being able to, having it available if we choose to see it, if it's important to us. And it affects our disposition towards things and the things disposition towards us as well. And, and that that ability to, to influence in both directions is a, is a really important part of this. And for me, there's, you know, there's a kind of scale thing and a, how it grows out. And our ability to be comfortable doing this with ourselves relates to our ability to be comfortable doing with our colleagues and therefore with our, you know, w with our customers. And I when I have a problem with the word customers. I tend to think of, um, I, I prefer to think of the people that support our business financially as partners. Mm. Um, so that we have, you know, in the sense that we have a shared interest in something happening and mm. that we're all trying to make that happen yeah. rather than customers in the sense that like, we're giving them something completely discreet and it goes away and it, it, we're no longer related after that. I think that's also, yeah, again, purpose-led businesses, I think is very much aligned with a lot of lot of that thinking of actually, and I think you're right, it starts with ourselves. I think why it's so important to have these conversations um, in the workplace as well. Like I've heard of and have worked with some amazing, you know, managers or, or leaders who are very attuned to themselves and, and create the space for other people to be as well. Um, and I think it's important, like also like what that looks like. So um, one of the advisors actually for the Good Business Club and also a member, uh, Rob Allcroft, um, uh, he's been amazing in terms of, of kind of building teams. And I kind of went to him when we we're looking at growing our team about, about that. And uh, a little a tip he kind of gave me in terms of meetings is just creating the space to share where your headspace is at. So anything, just be like, you know, come from a really stressful meet meeting or there's something happening in my personal life that is stressing me out or, you know, just to be there, no solution, no to delve into it, just to create that. So before you start a meeting, you know where everyone's head's at. So when, if things get heated, you know, it's probably not because of the conversation, it's something else that's going on. It's just practical and actually makes it much easier to communicate with people and not to have these underlying currents of, of things going on as well. Um, and I think that's what we need, like I said, leadership of like, what does being your full self mean? And also like not letting it be a space for just people, I guess, to moan or to, or, or to share too much, which I think is something people are sometimes concerned about. I think that's quite rare, to be honest. I think if you're quite compassionate with people and give them the space to share something, they probably will take it a little bit and not uh, like overuse it. Um, but we do need more leaders like that, kind of showcasing how you can be your full self and still be really um, good at what you're doing. Mm. Uh, it, it's a really interesting thing in leadership and, you know, the, the moaning thing and, and as relates to the kind of power that people have and, and whether that's really there in the organisation, how empowered people are to change things and not not how empowered you would like them to be and you think they are, but how empowered they really are. And that's that's quite a different thing in most organizations. I think a lot of a lot of leaders I've spoken to have been really, I think, 
kind of come with the assumption that people were more powerful than than they they actually mm -hmm. are and equally that that context you know and that's related to context not mattering actually mm -hmm. you know it's like it's okay for me to i might be able to talk about this with with a friend but if i don't if i can't be vulnerable with my 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 boss or you know with someone else if i can't share this in a meeting then there's a, there's a power thing there and there's an influence thing there mm. and it's it's actually it's for me it's it's the power of sensitivity and mm. the power of what we're aware of rather than the power of what we do and that they're subtly different things and they do relate because we tend to on an individual level get very good at working with the things we're most sensitive to simply because they we notice them and so we engage with them and we get good at them just through practice but we all have a different range of sensitivities we're all different to separate things and and accepting that you know that ability to sense things that other people don't mm -hmm. is a really important part of our value and and how we deliver value by seeing what others don't and being able to work with it in ways that others mm -hmm can't because they don't see it so sharply is is absolutely a really fundamental part of our work and from a leadership perspective understanding that the people you know what leadership is is is, is it's not about having that whole vision more clearly than anyone else you can't hold that you expecting yourself to do that is is not a healthy thing in either direction mm. it's it's a very different thing to, yeah. to kind of co-create and share that sense mm -hmm. sensitivity mm -hmm. yeah there's something definitely about that leadership as well isn't there around um it's not about having all the answers it's not that you're kind of different in a sense to anyone else it is just your uh, ability to to enroll people in something and and take them on a journey with you and i think you're right actually sensitivity and again i think connection to understanding humans fully as they are because it's not like we turn off being human when we go to work and we're some very easily molded thing like that's we're just fully humans and we know that things um like other relationships in your personal life are, are complicated and how you you know engage people is a challenge there it shouldn't be any different in work and you're right i think leaders are the ones who can be with other people understand them and to understand you need to understand what's going on for them as well and you know who they are and then you know give them the space to to entrust and give them the strength like you said to be like great you're no different than anyone else just carry on don't let it hold you back and I, and i think that that accepting that we don't have the answers yet that something's there but we don't have the answers yet is really interesting for me and i think that actually for me very strongly relates between mental health and innovation because one way to look at mental health is that we, we have a sense of something, we have a sensitivity, but we don't have a kind of allowed, practicable way of expressing it. You know, we feel this thing so acutely and it builds up in us and we can't let it out. It doesn't feel safe to let it out. So so we end up in tension or we end up expressing it in ways that aren't helpful, that direct it in a different place. And, and that, that, you know, that, that means that we, we can't have that really effective relationship with reality we end up with this with this thing in the way and mm -hmm. what's interesting there though is that by virtue of having that being being in that situation that means we we see things differently mm -hmm. we do have that different difference and if we can channel that well that's it is inherently different and inherently innovative and and, and i think that that sense of channeling that and um, allowing it to become useful, but being able to hold the fact that it isn't yet and we have to express it in less helpful ways and making it more useful is actually a lot of what real innovation is about. It's not, it, it isn't, and you look at the kind of, you know, the people held up as innovators, um, they don't have an easy, they haven't had easy lives. You know, you think about the, you know, particularly the people on the edge of, of kind of technical innovation, they, they, they're they very much very close to what many people would call madness. And I think creating a situation where we're okay with exploring that and allowing that and working with that rather than shying away from it in ourselves and in others. And if we're a leader, we need to be able to engage with this in others as well. Mm. It's, it's, is really fundamentally close and, and it, it's it's in a strange way it's very healing as well 
there's something definitely worth hearing in that around kind of old systems we talked about at the beginning around education and society and these norms and actually how can we instill more of this this kind of uh, ideas and and viewpoint as more more normal because I really believe that like this sense of normal just like is probably only a, a, you know not even fifty percent of, of, of the population actually if we look at all these different uh, kind of conversations that shape who we are as humans you know mental health is just one element of that there's do- lots of different things that we would distinguish as uh, having people unique to their identity and actually how can we go in society and into our education systems and showcase more of those people and more of those thinking as as the the norm and build that into into what people are understanding i think that shift of, of what normality is is it's huge and i think role models in that sense which mm. help everyone not just children everyone actually go oh that is like me and mm. okay maybe i am normal i don't know why we have to all feel like we have to be normal but there is the relatableness to that as well so there's something around there as well mm, i think that the, the difference between like being relatable and being the same mm. is really interesting for me and uh, you know is making ourselves relatable is 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 opening up our difference Mm-hmm. you know so that we can find that more commonality and, and join that but we can't do that without taking that that leap and and, yeah. and moving out into that space and and being able to do that is is privilege you know on some level it's power it's it's the fact that we have that ability and it's really interesting for me um mental health is a really interesting space because there are there are differences that are really obvious physically obvious mm-hmm. um so people kind of are immediately othered they're immediately in this other group if you're if you're a different you know if you experience things different on an internal basis but Mm. you look normal that's a very it's it's, in some ways it's the same thing but in some ways it's the exact opposite and people can respond very differently and we we have we have a slightly different set of ways to work with that and Mm. i think working with you know for all of us for our different and finding a way to express that in in wholesome ways and you know ways that bring together and, and create and and in, in in action in wholesome action as well or, or wholesome inaction but you know two sides of the same thing again um mm-hmm. but but really it's that how do we express that and i think you know innovation and understanding ourselves as as, as moving as when we have this edge we experience this edge and this this thing for us is allowing ourselves to work with that and accepting that for some people that's not their thing that's Mm -hmm. not their greatest value they have found you know they've got this strong sense of how things are and they they, they, there exists a profession there exists an area they can work in you know i've i've always felt a degree of jealousy with doctors in particular you know it's like you know having that immediate vocation and having a way to express it and it all being kind of done for you and that's a very different space to the space that we work in. And I think as relates to the kind of idealism and perfectionism thing is, 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 is there is, you know, the, the challenge there when you've got that space is perfecting, is, is making it really good, you know, making it better and better and better. The challenge for us is, is conceiving, is starting the thing and that getting started thing. But there is getting started well and getting started not so well. And yeah. for me, I think this connection with ourselves and being able to be our whole selves mm-hmm. is really what gives us that capability, opens up that possibility of starting really well. Mm. Yeah, there's two things I've kind of just heard in that. One is a, a realisation I've talked to a lot of people who've experienced mental health and there's something very common where when you're having a day that you're um, kind of being impacted by it, they will always use a kind of uh, a more physical kind of health issue as an easy escape route. So I you know I've got a headache, my, you know, stomach's not feeling great, you know, what, family issues. People are like, oh yeah, totally got it. Don't worry about it. Totally cool. Like there's something definitely a disconnect. So there's something about it's okay to not be okay with with certain things that people are related back to, and um, people have kind of got compassion to let people do what they need to do, but for some reason people are using excuses that aren't the truth around it. So why mm. why is there still a taboo around mental health versus physical health, for example? Um, I think the other thing that's also really important in this discussion that I'm just very aware of right now is, 
you know, if you'd talked to me about a lot of this stuff, maybe five, six years ago, before I kind of experienced anxiety, um, my perception of who I was and who other people was will be different. So some people listening to this conversation or maybe hearing this conversation in different places won't be able to relate to it. They just won't. And they won't be able to understand it in the way that you and I are here talking about it. And people maybe who, are, who can relate to it will understand it. And there's also a disconnect. So like, what, what can we do again to help to better understand this stuff and share it with people so that we can create a workspace where it isn't so them and us. It's like, this is happening. You're like, okay, great. Just like you would have once they got a stomach ache, they might not have had a stomach ache like that before, but they kind of get it. And that's like, okay, great. We understand that. Like there's something of bridging here of, of experience that a lot of people are having and this uh, unknown around it. So therefore it's a taboo because people don't really fully get it. So how can we, how can we bridge that? I don't know. Mm, I think it's it's really interesting, and, and uh, I've got um, I've got a question, a couple of questions uh, coming from uh, from the uh, from our community. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to uh, I'm going to share a couple of them now. If you've got any others, please do share them, because I think it's a it's really a good time to to bring this in. So we've got this this question from from Fresh Mind, which is. Um, what does the world of work look like if everyone brought their full selves to the workplace? And I think this is this is a really great question because it it gets to why we why we want to do this and you know having some idea of where we're going with a positive go like really does help me anchor in in yeah we want to change something and we want to remove something but we also want to go somewhere and, mm. and and the two together I think are actually really important being able to hold the two together at once is is a lot of this work in general and a really helpful thing to do so for you yeah what what kind of workplace what would it look like if we move in this direction that's a really great question so I'm going to kind of come from it a little bit from the more entrepreneur perspective because that's why like he said Matthew that's why I've been drawn to that as a place where I can see a potential there and I think what it would be is a lot of people creating businesses that are impacting you know positively themselves where they can be fully self-expressed and channeling their passions but for me that always looks like giving back that's always mm. if someone's satisfied with where they are they're always looking outwards at how they can contribute to other people so if you are fully i feel you're fully satisfied in in the work you're doing in your life you will look to to other people to support and contribute. So I guess that's my kind of drive really the work I'm doing is that vision of a world where everyone is supporting each other and a lot of the, I think there's a lot of, yeah, uh, energies that people kind of get trapped in when they're not fully self-expressed. I think for me, there's maybe a slightly different angle in that. And it's, it's actually around, yeah, the, the giving and, and a lot of the people I work with actually have a kind of over giving you know mm. they, they push very hard to give um and i think for me it's when that comes naturally when that flows when you can kind of give abundantly and move towards that place that, that's really what i'm interested in. so and that comes from a place of having met your own needs as well and mm. and because one of the things i experience is actually we you know we over give to others and it's as much a question of, of, of kind of having our own needs and, and, and accepting that and that then makes that point where it does flow and, and we can all support one another to that greater extent but it's not so much an outcome I'm not sure it ever reaches a fixed point it's more that it becomes easier you know we find greater ease in the work in the effort we can we can we can spend our energy for more effect mm. more positive effect for us and for other people the same amount of energy and that we move that forward and that's very we which i suppose is actually empowerment you know for me it's like workplaces and work becomes an empowering practice when mm. everyone can bring their full, them, their full selves to work it's really well put and there's something about being heard there isn't it i think there's something if people are heard and understood um it just changes what you want to do and you're not in defense the whole time you're wanting to be open and to contribute because you're not trying to feel like you have to defend yourself because people don't understand mm. Mm. and that that defending oneself against judgment i think is a really really interesting one and you know creating a situation at work where we have to defend ourselves against judgment and it feels like again it's, it's another expression of, of of that the idea that there's this perfect 
ideal mm. way of working and it's like we judge ourselves when we don't conform to that mm. you know and and the we've had that message over and over told to us over and over and kind of drilled into us so so it's it's a deeply embedded message for many of us but it's not a helpful message for for, for how we work and, and and how we express this stuff and yeah so it's 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 really you know really i think one of the challenges of working in this space is there isn't a recipe for any of this mm -hmm. there aren't clear steps for any of this but there are things you can do to get started and and so for me i think it would be interesting to explore how if someone's sat there you know listening to this and thinking yes definitely i want to do this i want to start with this what things can people explore, can people play with to get started in, in doing a bit more of this? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think for me, something I've really taken on this year um, as someone who only ever really shares the good and the successes, especially when it comes to social media, if you've got like a, a network, but also to your immediate network is just sharing when you're not OK. Like that's just been the thing I've taken on of like, when I so I do like uh, calls every week with the Good Business Club, and um, obviously feel like I have to have a sense of holding that space. But now I'll come on, and if if there is something, someone goes, "How are you?" I don't just go, "Yep, great, fine." I'll be like, "No, actually, it's been quite a tough week. Something's come up um, with this thing. It's just been a bit, you know, stressful." And for me, it's just the impact. The reason I keep doing it is the impact's been amazing of people that relatableness. Like I said, someone going, "Oh gosh, like that happened." someone I know last week or yeah no that I was in that space like two months ago where it is it just brings actually more connection so I've just taken that on um and and also yeah with my kind of wider network is share more the challenges I'm actually going through rather than feeling like I have to have everything always well so that's a small thing I would suggest to anyone is like just you know don't hold back in in sharing the same way that you would normally if you're happy with something or or that kind of way um and actually show when things aren't okay if you're anything like me and don't do that mm, that's great thank you and i think stress is a really interesting point we've got another question from from fresh mind so thank you about that about at which point does a person at work get considered as having mental health issues mm -hmm. and does a high level of stress count as a mental health issue and mm -hmm. i think stress is a really interesting one because stress is used to mean two things i personally i differentiate stress and pressure pressure some pressure is healthy pressure is 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 energy is drive you know it's, it's motivating force what creates stress though is not having an outlet for that or you know not having a clear way to do that or having competing kind of opposed sources of pressure so we're mm -hmm. kind of pulling or you know squashed in two directions or pull you know we we can't move um quite often i think we feel squashed in two directions and pulled into other ones as well you know when, when we feel that and i think one of the really big challenges with that is, again, that is in how we're thinking about things on some level and, and the models that we're facing. And when I say how we're thinking about things, I don't mean that we can just think about things differently and change it. That's not mm. how our minds work. We have to work with beliefs, engage with beliefs. So when I'm saying that, it's these practices, these ideas are actually about how we can change these beliefs and work with them. And, and for me, the, the, the best place to get started particularly at work, is to stop doing something. Mm. It's to choose just one thing, probably a relatively, something that feels like a chore and something that feels kind of unimportant, slightly unimportant, but that you just do because. If you can find one thing in your life, around your work, ideally, but, you know, and just stop doing it and see what happens. And don't you don't have to replace it with anything either. Just stop it let it let it stop and that that opens things up then and reduces a little bit of the stress and then when we've reduced the stress we can actually cope with more pressure mm. like stress is held pressure mm. you know and, and and i think you know it increases our capacity and our capacity to create change and positive change so for me that that i think is if i was going to give people one starting point mm. i'd really say yeah stop doing something Hmm. Can you remind me of the question, Matthew? Um, so yeah, so so uh, the the question that was shared was at which point 
does a person at work get considered as having mental health issues mm. and does a high level of stress count as a mental health issue yeah so it's interesting because i think my take would also be looking at like language so i think uh, when i talk about mental health the reason i use that word is because it's something that kind of fits a little bit of what i've kind of experienced and what i talk about it but actually when we're when I'm talking about full self, that's, I guess, why also I, I wanted to talk about full self rather than let's talk, focus on mental health, because actually, as humans, we've all got expression. It might not look the same way. It might not fit into boxes and neat categories in that way. But actually, it doesn't really matter for me if it's stress or it's anxiety or, you know, whatever those different things are. Why don't we just create a space where everyone can just fully be comfortable all the time and not have to worry? I've had actually other people I know as well who have reached out and been asking like I've got I can take mental health days off at work but I don't know if I'd class this as a mental health like is it a mental health issue and I'm like if you feel you have to take time off you probably have to take time off like take the time off whether it's a sick day or a mental health day like I don't think we should be categorizing it like why do we need to categorize it like if you at the point that you need to take time off take time off like I don't think I think, I think people are now are getting stressed whether they can class it as a mental health thing and I would say don't worry about like like having to to feel like you have to fit a criteria or or if it's not like bad enough like if you feel like you're stressed to the point it's impacting you in some way take time off like I said find out what those stress points are um, I think that's more important than actually defining whether it is mental health situation or not mm, yeah I, I think it's interesting different people express their suffering in different ways and mm. The challenge is knowing when we are suffering and, and we're being able to engage with that and giving ourselves the space to engage with that, mm -hmm. which can be time away, time off, um, mm -hmm. rather than being, you know, uh, carrying on or, or, or feeling that you can't can't take that space and say mm -hmm. okay there's a disconnect here there's something there's something not right here and, mm -hmm. and there's something really interesting for me around I, I slightly struggle with mental health as a word because it often means something very normative and and for me it's like are we talking about conformity are we talking about fitting in um and expressing things expressing the same things as everyone else responding the same way as everyone else or are we talking about finding a healthy and unique expression mm. and, and i think that latter one for me is is absolutely core to what we've been talking about is it, what is my healthy and unique expression of my energy, of myself, of what I want to see. And how can I create that for me? And I, how can I help other people to that for themselves hmm. rather than to that for, you know, to rather than it needing to be exactly the same as my expression of things? Hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of what communication is, really. It's just this is how I'm experiencing or viewing something. I want to share that with you. And these are the words that I know how to describe it. Um, again for relatableness like that's what we've got is the the talk that we've got is the words we've got um but i think you're right there's there's an element of um, not wanting to put everyone into boxes around it it doesn't have to be about uh, like a yeah conformity it can just be uh, a kind of deeper understanding really of something maybe that hasn't been fully communicated before mm, absolutely but i also want to make really clear you know for me this is a practice this is something we, you know, we do and we engage with and we get better at and grows in, in, in its effectiveness over time. It's, it's absolutely a practice. And it isn't something that we can kind of follow a set series of steps and learn, but we can engage with people who are doing it. And I think, you know, you mentioned this idea of kind of modeling this stuff and living this stuff and showing this stuff as well and how powerful that is and how effective that is at helping others, because that, that then gives them a chance to build their own practice, you know, and, and, and completely with words, it's like, it's all very well me describing something and however well I describe it, but I can never give you that full sense of what it is to experience it yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I can tell you, about water i can tell you about rivers and the sea but you've no idea what wet feels like until you've put your hand in in a bath you know and it mm. it's a it's a different thing and and um practices are very much about the the joining of those two things you know how do we move towards the feelings that we want and the, these 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 kind of personal subjective experiences that we want but in in this way collectively together and i think you know thinking about how you're working and, and allowing yourself to develop that expressive practice and your business mm. practice 
you know, whether that, whether your business, you know, primarily the people I work with specifically do pra have practice businesses. So their main domain of value is in this practice space. Mm -hmm. But whatever your domain of value is for your business, you know, whether you're making, you know, whether you're you're kind of providing instruction for people or whether you're providing physical product or whether you're kind of doing creative, you know, creative output, whatever that is, um, it's, it's really what is your business practice and how can you allow yourself to develop that and that, you know, in that, but for you as a unique expression of you. Mm. Yeah, I think it's really well put. So it's actually a question we get asked a lot also in the Good Business Club, like what is a good business as if it's like this this one framework. There's a template for good business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, there's not, there's, you're right, it's, it's different values and some people might share your values, other people might share different values and you're right, it, it comes from, from your understanding your experience and i think going out there and the more you can understand and ex like understand other people's experiences that kind of just adds to what you what you know and understand and then you can shape something for yourself and your business as well so the more you can go and understand other people and just take it in like you know, even if you've not experienced it and go that's interesting like what could i do in my business that would that would actually have a good a good impact for other people who maybe experience things that i don't uh, is always a, a good practice to take on as well Mm, that's great thank you very much so if uh, someone watching this has you know enjoyed this conversation and, and really wants to to kind of get in touch with you and continue the conversation what's the best way for them to get in touch with you so the best way to get in touch with me is you can either email me at sarah at sarah .com, um, or find me on linkedin um i'm on instagram and twitter as well but linkedin is probably a good place to just uh, reach out connect with me drop me drop me a message on there Great, cool, and we'll share those links in the uh, in in the description uh, as soon as I've got a chance to to edit it, which hopefully okay. shouldn't be too long. Um, is there anything specific uh, that you're doing coming up that you'd like people that you might like to invite people to or people to engage with at all? Absolutely. So um, I've actually today just launched um, the Good Business Roadmap. So uh, as I said, I've been working with uh, early stage businesses for the last six years, um, as well as starting up my own businesses. And I want to translate that and help other people take their businesses off the ground. So uh, starting in February, I've got an 11 week uh, online course at the moment specifically for Sussex uh, based entrepreneurs, um, which includes kind of group sessions uh, and kind of problem solving sessions as well as workshops. Um, and then also an opportunity to pitch for £20,000 of funding from a local investor as well. So very much if you've got an idea and you're just trying to understand what steps to take and you kind of want to avoid the common things that people normally get caught up in and just get some practical support on just everything from setting up a bank account to launching a website. Um, yeah, you can find it on my website, uh, sarahosterholzer.com. Lovely. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I hope that's raised some interesting thoughts for you uh, and, and you've really kind of found this that's a good conversation if it has then yeah please do uh, get in touch with sarah or get in touch with me leave comments uh would love to hear from you in the community and and to move that forward and kind of because this is about you as well and exactly as we've been talking about you know your your perspective and your take on this is just as valuable um the next episode coming up uh which is uh 1 p.m UK time on Tuesday rather than Wednesday next week. So that's Tuesday the 15th. I'll be talking to Simon Batchelor uh, and we'll be talking about the assumption people buy answers, which I think is very interesting in terms of what we've just spoken to. I love how these kind of intersect. So uh, so one of the big problems with 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 all of this space is like how do we how do we sell this stuff if we don't know don't know what we're really talking about you know how do we sell uncertainty and i think so we're going to be talking about people buy answers so i'm very very excited to to talk about that um thank you very much sarah that was, i really enjoyed that conversation so yeah thank you for joining us no thank you so much matthew for having me it's been great to explore something that's also yeah very close to my heart this year um and it was an exploration i'm still discovering a lot and i have in this conversation so thank you that's great. Thank you. Um, and thank you all very much for watching. Um, you really is the audience that make this show. Um, if you would like to support us, what I would like you to do is really share your perspective with someone away from this. You know, 
what did you take away from it? What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? Talk to someone else about this. That is the most important thing that you can do to support us. And yet, yeah, go out there and create some delightful dissent of your own. So thank you very much for watching and see you again soon.